Amen. Thanks, Lee. All right. Thank you. Um, we are speaking on can you know for 100% that you are going to heaven? Um, or is it destination unknown for you? I'm going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at various scriptures and kind of see the, what's the gist? You know, there's so many doctrines in scripture or that we we pull out of scripture and it doesn't, doesn't they don't come from one scripture alone, but uh, it's a, we see it throughout uh, the Bible. And so they pull it all together into a, a teaching, a doctrine. And today we're going to be talking about one of those. Let me ask you. If you were to die right now, can you tell me by for one hundred percent you know for sure that you're going to be in heaven? What about if you were going to if you died three months from now? Could you tell me right now that you know three months from now if you die you're going to go be in heaven? For sure, you know it's a fact. How about three years from now? What about thirty years from now? Can you tell me right now that any time you die from now into the future, you're going to end up in heaven? How about, do you know for 100% sure that 300 years from now, you will be with God in heaven? Can you know that for sure? Is that a, something you can know for 100%? I'm here today to show you in scripture that yes, you can know for 100% sure. Your, desti your final destination. Think about that. 300 years from now, I'm guaranteed that I'm going to be with God in heaven. What an what a, what a awesome thing to think about. So there are literally billions of people in this world who do not know what happens after death. You ask them and they say, I don't know, you disappear or I don't know. Um, if you... In fact, if you claim to know, then oftentimes people mock you and say, how can you know? There's no way. Um, according to populationmatters.com, there are approximately 29% of this world's population, or 2.3 billion people who claim to be Christian. It doesn't mean they're all Christian, but they claim to be Christian. And of those who claim Christianity, if I'm, I'm sure if you ask them, do you know 100% for sure that you're going to heaven if you die right now? A large percentage of those, because I've talked to several, uh, will fall into three different categories. Do you fall into one of these categories? First category is the if I'm good enough category. These people um, think that Maybe if you're a Christian and that God has given you the tools to live a Christian life, a righteous life, a good enough life. And this person might think that at the end of my life, if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then yeah, God's going to let me in. And, and that's a, actually a lot of uh, religions in this world believe that. Uh, if they were good enough, they will be welcomed into heaven. Some people won't tell, admit they believe that, but they're living like that. They think that, if I just, you know, if I sin, oh my goodness, I might not be good enough. Matthew uh, 7.22, we know this. This is actually what um, was quoted earlier today by Colin. Matthew 7.22, many will come to me in that day. Actually, no, I'm sorry. That's later. This is a different one. Many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And in your name we cast out demons, and in your name we did many mighty works. See, they were working. They were doing all these things to be accepted. And Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. It's kind of, that's one of the scariest verses in the Bible. Second one is the IDK category. This is for the older, I mean, for the older people out there, IDK means I don't know. Uh, my fifth graders, when they were in third grade, you see, uh, they would be given permission that on the, like the pretest. So you can put, if you have no idea, you put IDK. 
And so they've kind of carried that over. So in fifth grade, they kept asking me, can I put IDK? I said, no, do your best. Um, but the I don't know crowd, these people are kind of oblivious to what God teaches on this matter, which indicates another major problem of Christianity today, right? And that is we're a bunch of ignorant Christians. Many Christians, we don't know our Bibles. We don't know our Bibles enough to live an abundant life for Christ. You need to know your Bible, not to achieve some higher level of Christianity, but to know what happens when you live with God, to know what promises God has given us through Jesus. As a Christian, we should make it our focus to know our Bibles. Why? Well, I want, you, I want to read something uh, from 1 John, which we're going to come back to later, but this is super important. It says, I write these things, 1 John 5, 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. He's not writing to non-Christians. He's writing to those who are Christians. He says, why? That you may know that you have eternal life. See, the knowledge of eternal life, the assurance of eternal life comes from Scripture. And if you are not reading your Bible, then you're going to be an ignorant, confused, weak Christian. And I can't say that enough. Third is the yes, but crowd. Oops, let me go back. Third is the yes, but crowd. These are the people who, who they know now, if they die, go to heaven. They'll go to heaven. But they, these people believe that they're saved and made righteous in God's eyes, and all sins are forgiven, and their place in heaven is reserved. However, however, they believe that they still can commit the unforgivable sin and be removed from that salvation. This is not correct. This is wrong thinking. Scripture doesn't talk about this. There's a couple of verses they point to, but good study of those verses makes you realize they're not talking about losing salvation. Let me read a couple of quotes I found that were very interesting that, that would fit with this. Um, one person said, if we could lose our eternal salvation, then it wouldn't be eternal. John MacArthur says, and this one is, uh, I think, most fitting, if you could lose your salvation, you would. None of us are righteous. None of us on our own can do the right thing. We all sin, even Christians. We Christians choose to sin at times. And if we could lose our salvation, we would. And then Paul Washer says, if a person professes faith in Christ and yet falls away or makes no progress in godliness, it does not mean that he has lost his salvation. It reveals that he was never truly converted. Now, how can we say that? How can we say those things? Because there's a promise. There are promises that we need to watch. Now, Let's look at this thing. As a Christian, we are guaranteed to go to heaven. The doctrine is called assurance of salvation. It means that we can know for sure. John Calvin called it the perseverance of the saints. His focus was on the idea that a true Christian will ultimately continue in your walk. Now, does that mean that we won't sin? No, we're going to sin. But there's going to be a continual repentance. And we will continue for, to persevere to, to uh, chase after God's ways. And then finally, there's uh, a modern translation, I guess you might say, is once saved, always saved. Problem is with this is there's, the focus is too much on one point and not a continual living 
Um, so you can know for sure you will continue to live in Christ if you are saved. There are a lot of people, though, that have this false sense of assurance. Like, the peop- like those in Matthew, they think they're saved. They're self-deceived into thinking that they are a Christian. Can you imagine living all your life and then at the final trumpet, being told, oh, flee from me or go away from me. I never knew you. What if you, you even prophesy, you preach Jesus? What if you cast out demons in the name of Jesus? What if you even did some mighty works? You know, I started this huge uh, NGO to feed the poor in the name of Jesus. But yet, you're still not, have a, you don't have that relationship with Jesus. Imagine that. Aren't there a lot of people even today, tell, we call them televangelists. That was the old word for them. Now they're just tele, television preachers. And they do this stuff. These are the people I think this is applying to today. They get up there and they say, you need to love yourself. You need to take care of yourself. God wants you to care for yourself. They're self-deceived and they're deceiving others. And there's a couple of reasons why, I think. First of all, people don't really understand the gospel. And by gospel, I don't mean the facts of the gospel, that Jesus was born, lived as a man, died on, uh, on the cross, and was raised the third day. See, Satan knows that better than any of us do. And yet, he's not a Christian. They don't understand that the, what the gospel is all about. They don't understand why the gospel is vital to us, to this world. Why did Jesus have to die? Why do you have to accept Jesus? There's no deep understanding. Nor have these people done a deep dive into trying to understand what Scripture says regarding God, the gospel. I'm not saying you, in order to be saved, you have to totally have a deep dive and understand it. What I'm saying is, if you're saved, you will want to have, do a deep dive so you can understand it. Did you know that, according to scriptures, that not even the angels understand this gospel? 1 Peter 1.12 says, that The things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. They really want to understand this gospel and God's working here on earth. And we have the Bible so we can. The second group of people are uh, the people who do this emotional connection. Um, there's a lot of Christians these days who base their Christianity on feelings. The idea is that if you feel good about God, if you have some emotional attraction to God, which might be called love, if you believe in Jesus and you want to connect to Jesus and, and you want some sort of association with Jesus, and be a part of what Jesus is doing, and you want Jesus to kind of work with you and make you what you want to be, then you're, you're in. Often the, possi- the prosperity gospel produces these pseudo-Christians, not real Christians, because Christianity that they're preaching is man-focused Christianity. It's a love yourself in order to love God and love others. It's a be the best you can be so that you can be the best Christian you can be. You know, nowhere in Scripture are we ever told that we must love ourselves. In fact, Scripture assumes that we all do love ourselves, sometimes too much. Scripture tells us to love God with everything you are, 
and love your neighbor as yourself. See, and I'm, I'm sorry if I offended people, but the point is our focus should not be on ourselves. It should be on God. And in response, God gives us a confidence, a, a faith in ourselves to understand who we are under Jesus. As Christians, you should be second to, actually, you should be third. God is first, others are second, you're a third. And so these prosperity people, they don't preach that. They preach, you need to rise. So we need to stay away from that type of a gospel. Lastly, and this one kind of incorporates, incorporates all of them, uh, is this idea that we fail to examine ourselves. Throughout Scripture, we're told, examine yourself. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. I'm continuing, test yourself. Or do you not realize, that, realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you fail to meet the test. You see what he's saying there? Examine yourself. Use scripture to examine yourself. What does that word examine mean? What does that mean to examine yourself? Well, think of taking stock of your spiritual standing. Picture a, a person who works in a warehouse, and they have to take uh, inventory. They, they, got, they have this the checklist, and they got to go throughout the the. Uh, warehouse, and they have to figure out how many of each of the items they should have, they have, right? So they're comparing the re reality with what's written down. And that's what it means to examine yourself. Compare re your reality with what's written in the word of how you should be. Now, isn't that just like having a checklist of well, do's and don'ts of a Christianity. Well, yes and no, cause, but it's not a, it's not a, you know, you walk this way, you do this thing, and you're a Christian. It's deeper. And you don't understand that unless you're really in the worst scriptures and, and, and you're, the Holy Spirit's able to speak with you through the scriptures. So, Likewise, we need to take stock of our lives. If you're truly a Christian, you should be reading your Bible and comparing the life Jesus has for you, the verses about that, with how you are living your life and your attitudes, and how do you measure up. And here we're at the prodigal son. The prodigal son examined himself. He took stock. He says, but when he came to his senses which is the same idea, examining yourself. He said, he, he realized he was lacking, right? He examined himself and realized, wow, I'm lacking. I have, my father has hired servants who have more than enough bread. And here I am dying here from hunger because of my sin. I'm going to get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. Interesting, he would say, I've sinned against heaven. Not against you, Father, but I've sinned against heaven. And in your sight, I am no longer even worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Repentance comes from examining yourself. Repentance in a big way or repentance on, in little things. It just means changing, right? It means going, turning the other way, turning from that and going towards God. It's willing to do what it takes to be accepted. So true Christians are guaranteed heaven now and forever. Eternal, it's eternal. But there is a sense of false assurance that we could get. How do we know if we're Christians? Can you know for sure? How do you eat? So, so we know through Scripture that the promise is that you will go to heaven. Can we know for sure if we're a Christian now? 
I say, yes, we can. How do you know if we have this assurance of eternal destiny in heaven? Well, God promises it. We see that. So what is a Christian? I want, you, I want to look at a couple of, of verses that shows the promises of God first, and then hopefully we have time to, to look at uh, like a test, scriptural test of Christianity. 1 John 5, 10 to 13 says, well, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar. Made who a liar? Made God a liar. Because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. See, if if you deny that, then you do not have that testimony and you are not a Christian. And by the way, that's an unforgivable sin right there. It's denying Christ. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And this is what John says first in, in First John. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have temporary life. No, that you may know that you have eternal life. What does eternal mean? The actual Greek word means everlasting, forever, forever, forever life. That's what it actually means. Okay, looking at John 5.25. Uh, 24. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has what? Eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. I want to look at some of these transitions here. Um, It says that if you hear his word and believe him who sent me, you have eternal life. Okay. If you have eternal life. You don't come into judgment. But wait, if I have eternal life, what if I sin? You don't come into judgment. What if I do this? You don't come into judgment. How can that be? How come I don't come into judgment? Well, because you've been transferred from death to life. Only those who are dying come into eternal judgment. Those in life do not come into judgment. You're in a different category now. Completely different category. There is the, the final judgment in which your works will be judged. Your life will be judged of how much you saved of the denarii and how much you made in the denarii. And it's not a judgment, it's a reward system where God thanks you uh, and you just lay them at his feet saying, this is all for you, Lord. But you don't, you're out of the category of being able to be judged completely for that eternal judgment. So you see, we're different category. John 10, 27, 29 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them this eternal life, and they will what? They will never perish. I give them eternal life and they won't perish unless they do something really bad. No, they will never perish. And listen to this. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Who's this speaking? This is Jesus. The one who, through whom this whole universe was created. He's saying he's got you in his hand and no one will take them out of his hands. Not, Sin, not Satan, no one will take them out of his hands. But he goes further. He says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. That is a sure sign of security because, I'm, I'm, you know, my sins are not strong enough to, to defeat Jesus. My sins are not strong enough to defeat Jesus. If I, have a, if I am a son of God, 
I am secure. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 says this, In whom you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in ancient times, the king would have a seal, right? They would write a letter, he would fold it up, he would drip some, some wax, and with his ring signet, he would seal that letter, and you knew that letter came from the king or some official, depending on whose seal was on that. Guess what? We have the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. People should look at you and say, oh, he belongs to God because I can see the seal of the Holy Spirit on him because his, the way he loves God and the way he lives his life. Again, it's not a you know, I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I don't go with girls who do type of thing, uh, whatever that is. But it's, it's a heart change, life change, direction change. And with more, he can, uh, Paul continues, said that Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance, the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. That Holy Spirit, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is indwelling us. The Holy Spirit is our seal, guaranteeing that we are from the Father. And he is our guarantee of our inheritance of what's coming in the future when we die and we finally take possession of that inheritance to the praise of his glory. If you are saved, you are eternally saved. If you are saved, you are eternally saved. You have an eternal relationship with God. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. Who, with your, with your soul, transforms you throughout your life. You see, it's not me who transforms me. It's, it's the Holy Spirit and God who transforms me from the inside out. He's the one that sets up uh, scenarios for me to grow in. It's all him. Problem is, we have people who are false assurance. And John Murray, in his book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, wrote this. In order to place the doctrine of perseverance in proper light, we need to know what it is not. This is the perseverance of the saints. It does not mean that everyone who professes faith in Christ and who is accepted as a believer in a church, in a fellowship of the saints, is secure for eternity. What? You just said we are. No. doesn't mean that everyone who says they are is and may and, and this person may entertain that they do have this assurance well our lord himself warned his followers in the days of that he was here in the days of his flesh when he said to those people to the jews who believed in him if ye continue in my word then are ye truly my disciples and ye shall Know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Let me say that again in, in today's English. If you continue my word, then you're truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Jesus himself set up the criterion by which true disciples might be distinguished from false disciples, and that criterion is a continuance in Jesus' word. See, what, he say, what Murray is saying here that, that Jesus said is that if you're, his, if you're his, truly his disciples, you will continue as his disciple. If, you're his, if you claim to be his disciple and you fall away and you walk away from the faith, well, that's showing that you were never truly his disciple. How do we know if we are truly his disciple? I have five minutes. 
actually, I'm, yeah, five minutes to, to quickly go through this. And I have a major challenge for you at the end. In 1 John, there's seven marks of a true Christian. And I want to, want to breeze through this, but I'm going to challenge you to go back on your own and study. So here we go. First of all, a belief in the deity of Christ. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Have you ever accepted Jesus as your Savior? Jesus says, who do you say I am? Jesus says, who do you say Jesus is? Do, you believe, do I believe in Jesus, the Son of God who died and was res resurrected? Do I have faith in Jesus and believe he is the only way to eternal life? Marker one. Marker two, obedience to God's commands. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. Am I keeping God's word? Do I desire to keep God's commandments and please him? Do I obey his commandment out of love? You know what his main commandment is? Love God and love others. His main commandment amounts to love. Loving God first and loving people. Um, do you reject the world? He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I have to go back. What do prosperity teachers want you to do? They want you to be successful in this world. Why? Because they think Jesus wants you to be rich and successful. It's totally wrong. You need to not love this world. I am so tired of all the sin in all the craziness, in all the hatred in this world, so many times I've just prayed, Lord, please come. I'm so tired of this. Do you hate the world system and the sin that's in the world? And the love of money, the love of power, and the hatred that people have? Do you hate that? God says it's okay to hate evil. Four, repentance from sin. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Do we sin? Yes. Do we want to sin? No. If you're a Christian and you sin and you feel no remorse, that's a marker that you may be a false Christian. You should feel remorse for your sin. Even We, we even get pulled into uh, conscious sin. I don't know about you, but I've gotten myself pulled into some. I've even said to me, I know this is wrong to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Later to feel so bad and to repent and to confess it. Am I, are you living in sin? Do you, or do you confess and repent of your sin when you do it? Does your sin grieve you, or do you enjoy it? The flesh enjoys sin, but your heart should hate it. Are you trying to practice righteousness? Marker five, love for others. By the way, this isn't a seven-step thing. You don't do this first, second, third, fourth. No, this is an all-encompassing cloud of who you are as a Christian. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Do I love others? Do I love others because God loves me or for selfish reasons? Do I demonstrate Christ-like love to others? Or do I harbor hatred in my heart? for people. Is there anyone, especially believers, we are especially called to love fellow believers. Six, rejection of false teaching. We're to reject false teaching. And John says here, says, they are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world. 
and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. And who's he talking about? These are the apostles. Whoever knows God will listen to the apostles. How do you listen to the apostles? You read the Bible. You read their words. God spoke through them a message for us. Whoever is not from God does not listen. So if you're, read, you're from God, you will read the Bible and hear what is being said. If you're not, you're going to be pulled astray by any false teaching that makes you feel good. Am I listening to known false teachers? When someone says to me, that guy is a false teacher, that woman is a false teacher, do I just disregard what they say and just go ahead and listen to them? Or do I investigate and say, oh, wait, maybe he is. I need to check this out. You listen. I, I went to a seminar one time. It was uh, about life and how to live life. Uh, and it was a Christian seminar, Christian, quote, unquote, seminar. Um, and I learned a lot. I really did. But then I went back after being in Bible school a little bit, and I realized a lot of the scripture he was using was he was misusing. It's not what that scripture meant. And see, and he was giving good information, but he was still misusing scripture. False teachers misuse scripture all the time so that they'll tickle your ears, so you'll like it and you'll come back, and you'll spend money, and you'll give money, and you'll buy their books. They built huge enterprises. Francis Chan, at one time, he's a preacher. He was a preacher of a mega church. People love him. You can get his teachings all over the internet. At one point, he, he got tired of being a pastor of a mega church because he was like Mr. Very Popular. He, uh, he actually... He's, he challenged the church, we're going to give away 80% of all the money we get, that comes into us. We're just going to give it away. He has multiple books out. None of that money comes to him. He's pledged away all of the book money to other organizations, to helping further the gospel. He's now moved to Hong Kong because he felt God was calling him to reach uh, locals here. There's a man who, who there's a, he's a, he's, he has a heart and a passion for God, not for things. Lastly, you know you're saved because you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. Do I sense the Holy Spirit empowering me and leading my life? I'm not saying do I speak in tongues. It's, that is never told, said to be a uh, guarantee of the Holy Spirit. Did you know there's, there's cults that speak in tongues? Speaking in tongues, it was just a sign that they had. Galatians 5.22, the fruits of the Spirit, that's a more appropriate measure of, of whether or not you have the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, and you know them. If you don't, look at Galatians 5.22. That's the marker of having the Holy Spirit. Now, keep in mind, you're not saved because you do those things. Those things are a reflection of your heart filled with the Holy Spirit. So those are six things. So, I mean, sorry, seven things that are markers, and they're straight from... First John. So there's my challenge. Read First John from beginning to end and keep notes. Read First John from beginning to end and keep notes. And I have just like any game, I you can you can jump in at any level. And I want I would challenge you to jump on the highest level, the five by five, which there's five chapters. I want you to read the five chapters every day for five days, keeping notes and reflecting, are you living up to your relationship with Jesus Christ? Five times 
five chapters. Or you can go into the second level, five by three. That means you read two and a half or three chapters each day for six days. It means you'll read through it three times, a five by three reading program. As for John. Or on the lowest level, if you just can't find the time, which I challenge you to find the time because, you know, I don't know about you, but I do so many things that are kind of a waste of time. A five by one, read all five chapters through this week. Everyone should be able to do that. It's just five simple chapters. All of you should be able to do five by five. And I guarantee you, it's going to transform your view of your Christianity. So that's your challenge. Let me pray for us. Father God, I praise you and I thank you for this message. Thank you that we can know for sure that we are part of your family. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who seals us and guarantees our place in heaven. I pray that we would know that we know you. I pray that we would live that we in the, in the, we would live that out. If you know, if we know that we know you and we know that 300 years from now we're going to be with you and be uh, comparing stories with people and and we're going to be in your presence, we should live like that today knowing that that's coming. And I pray that you would help us to do that, Lord. Everyone who's here who heard the word today, I pray that it would blessed that they would were blessed as much as I was blessed by your word, Lord. And I, I pray that you would just transform hearts. If there's anyone here who don't who looks at that what we just briefly went over and said, wait, I don't measure up to that. I pray that you would convict them, convict them to repent and turn and turn to you, Lord. And bow their knee and give their lives to you. Help them, Lord, fill them with your spirit so that they know what life is, what eternal life is. Lord, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for giving me this chance to share.